Welcome to Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd, and on this show, we talk about in-depth subjects with experts. Today on Digging Deeper, we are coming live from the Backyard Farmer Garden. You know, we hope you've been enjoying this series on Facebook this year because it's the first time we've tried to do it. So for the next 20 minutes, we are going to be answering questions from the audience. A lot of fun, we did it at the fair. We have a big line queued up. So first up, what, who are you, where are you from, and what is your question? Thank you for taking our questions. I'm Catherine Urbanik from rural Ulysses, Nebraska. I brought in a sample, several samples of, um, I call it a weed growing in my yard and I'd like to know what it is and how to get rid of it. Because I have a large area, I have a 40 gallon tank that I can put chemicals into. You're up, I think, <laughs> All Bill. right, right to it. Uh, this is one of the samples um, that she brought in. Um, you know, what's nice to have a sample here because you can do a little bit better uh, identification of it. Uh, looking at this one just quickly, uh, it looks like it's a weed uh, orchard grass. Um, it's, a, it's a cool season uh, weed that can kind of really be pervasive, especially in kind of rural parts of, uh, uh, of Nebraska. Um, from a control perspective, uh, unfortunately, I think off the top of my head, I'm thinking probably non-selective is what we're going to be limited to, unfortunately. We're not going to have a lot of really easily things that you can go off and spray because it's going to be a grass that's it's very similar to our lawn type grasses. And so if you're trying to control it, um, and another grass like that would be uh, like quack grass. You know, it's very similar, so we don't have anything you can use to just spray specific, uh, just get the orchard grass. Um, and so you're gonna look at something like a Roundup or something to actually just kill off where it is and try to reseed, unfortunately. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for the bad news, but uh, <laughs> that might be uh, one of your, yeah, your limitations off the top of my head right now. None of those I brought were uh, sage. No. Yellow sage or? No, or, okay. or a nut sedge or anything like that. No, it's, uh, it, it's almost a very similar leaf style to what a bluegrass looks like. Um, but, uh, you know, this looks like, uh, you know, orchard grass and that's why it's really hard to control. It is very similar to the bluegrasses and fescues and things like that. There's nothing I can spray so it won't even multiply or anything? Not really. Um, all you can try to do is uh, maintain the health of that bluegrass, but what you may want to do is just try to kill off that area and, and, and then, you know, reseed. And, and that's really going to be, unfortunately, one of the things that, you know, is going to work best for this situation. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Sorry for the bad news. Yeah. All right. Next up. <laughs> I'm Steve Dyer. I live here in Lincoln, 60, 69th and Fremont. About a year ago, uh, these little white things started flying out of our tree in, in the air. We thought it was cottonwood seeds. Okay. They're very tiny, but they're fuzzy. I know what they are. What are they? <laughs> so those are woolly aphids. Really? And do you have like a maple close by or what kind most, of trees most, do you have? Mostly uh, pen oaks. Okay, are they like pretty big up in there? Yeah. Yeah? Well, a lot of times they're in maple, but they're like a woolly aphid. But every once in a while they will get winged adults and they'll start flying around and they do look like little fuzzy cotton fuzz fl Maybe flying around. This year, about about this time last year, they appeared and then about about a week ago again and then yep. they disappear. Yep, because the adults don't live very long. So, but that's what you're seeing. They're not dangerous. Oh, no, they're not. Good, all right, thank you. <laughs> And for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, they look like ivory soap flakes flying around in your yard. Yeah, don't go like this. Yeah, don't go like <laughs> this, Jody says. All right. Good afternoon, Diane Moore from west of Denton. I have a Montmorency cherry tree in the middle of my orchard. It's surrounded by apples and apricots. And it, in uh, the second week of July, it started getting yellow leaves on the south side and it's progressed to the whole top of the tree is gone. I haven't seen any bugs, and I haven't seen any cankers. Help. So we, yep, when we take a look at that leaf, the leaf is completely yellow, but we got black spots all over yeah. it, right? Yeah. So unfortunately, what you have is you have a fungal infection. Now remember, I'm the hort lady, not the path lady, so as to what exactly which one, um, but we've been seeing a lot of fungal infections this year, and once we see those spots on the leaves, it's too late to apply that preventative fungicide. 
So if you wanted to spray, we're looking at spraying throughout the growing season, every seven to 10 days, spraying religiously. If we get a heavy dew, if we get a rain, you're looking at reapplication. So it's up to you if you want to try to do that next year. This year, what you can do is you can go ahead and you can um, do that good fall cleanup and get those leaves out of there if at all possible okay. so it doesn't act like an inoculant source for next year and then reinfest next year. Um, most of the time when we're looking at those sprays, like for fungicides, um, okay. we'd be aiming for when the leaves are out, but we don't want to do it when the petals are still on the tree. So we do it like 90% petal fall. A lot of those fungal infections um, at that time, we want to make sure we apply it then. Okay. But you think it'll live through the winter? <clears throat> it should. <laughs> okay. um, you know, if you're not seeing any canker, you're not seeing any ooze, you're mm -hmm. not seeing any of those other ones that are those red flags, Mount Morrissey is one of the hardy ones for our area, so that's a good one. Um, I'd make sure that has adequate moisture, so if all of a sudden the rain shuts off, we need to make sure that it gets about an inch, but we need to let it harden off as we get into to closer to winter. So by the time we get to October, just shut off the spigot and let it go dormant on its own. Okay, well thanks a lot. So those of you who don't know what Montmorency cherry looks like, we have one right over here that you can go look at a little bit later. Hi, I'm Doug Foss and I live on an acreage near Roca. I brought in a, I think it was a Cotone Aster sample. It's a 30 year old hedge and every spring it looks beautiful and healthy and then about late July or August, it starts to look like that. And I wondered what it is and how to prevent it next year. So you have two things going on here, and I'll talk about the first one. The first one is a fungal infection. So we've got those leaf spots on here again. Um, the thing to keep in mind is we're looking at preventative fungicide treatments if you wanted to um, throughout the growing season. Sorry, didn't mean to wiggle it on you. Um, so we've got those black spots on here. The other thing we have going on is down here by my finger and it's a Jody question. I think that one is a caterpillar. So a lot of times we'll see uh, caterpillars uh, use leaves and roll themselves up to pupate. So it's a type of leaf roller. So if you saw any like chewing or like little, I guess, bites out of the leaves, the defoliator, that could have been a caterpillar. Um, I don't know if, if that type um, gets the lace bugs as well. Is that one? No, not as much. So. No. But yeah, yeah, so that one's the caterpillar that's rolled up. So do you spray for those or, um, or not? not normally? I mean, did you see a lot of those little brown leaf um, rolled up? Most of the uh, individual shrubs have a couple on them. Okay, I mean, if you think the defoliation, it's probably up to you. If you think it's too unsightful, insightful, then you could um, use a, a BT on okay. that early when they're little. All right, thank okay. you. Thanks. All right, next up. James Soshik Jr. Prague, Nebraska. I have a pin oak there. My question is, uh, during the spring and early summer, we had buzzing from flies, bees, wasps, and a few uh, skippers were on there. Are the nodules on that plant uh, an insect? Is that what's secreting something that makes the flies? Makes the, okay. So oak trees get a lot, a lot of different insect pests. And so on there, these little lumps that you're talking about, these nodules are galls. And so it's formed by, you know, the plant over top of something that the insect has done. So in there is developing insects. Um, but then looking at just even just this one twig, um, you've got like oak, Oak leaf miner, um, that's those brown patches here. Uh oh, I'm terrible. I'm just gonna look away. <laughs> um, those little brown spots that are there, so those are moths. But the things that attract the butterflies and the wasps are mostly something that's going to exude honeydew. So in oaks, a lot of times it's like a, a lace bug, mm -hmm. so that that's up there. Sometimes they're really, really tiny. Um, but that's what's dripping down, unless you have a wasp nest up there, you know? And a lot of times, maybe early in the season, you can spray it with a hose, depending on what's underneath, but, uh, this you know. This is 40 years old. Yeah, that's kind of like the one we have. There's not much Fire we can do hose. about it. Fire hose. So, <laughs> but, and then this might be twig girdler. 
So at the end of the season, like when, when the leaves fall, you're going to want to rake all those up and get rid of those leaves. So, okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. All right. So everything from, we don't have any critter questions yet, Dennis. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. I'm, enjoying, I'm enjoying the day. You're relaxing, right? Yeah, relaxing. All right. Hi, uh, I'm Bobby Connolly. I'm from Lincoln. And we have uh, sort of overrun with Creeping Charlie in the backyard. And if we get rid of it, I think we're going to end up with dirt, which means we'll have to reseed. So my question is, what do you do first? Do you seed and then treat, or do you treat and then seed, and what's the time difference? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would do, you know, specific treatments for weeds like perennial, weeds like Creeping Charlie, if you have a strong enough stand there to begin with. Ultimately, though, if you think you're just going to kill off, like, the weeds that we have in front of us uh, right here, um, and there's not going to be much grass there, it'd be best to just do a non-selective herbicide, get it clean, you know, till it up, till some compost in it, the soil's compacted like it is here. You know, do things to improve the soil and then seed that area. That would be one of the better things to do. Uh, you know, selectively trying to control weeds. I'd only take that approach if there's enough grass there to begin with. Uh, some of the herbicides can hurt the, the, uh, the seedlings if they came up. And so that would be one of my fears, I think, is if you seeded now and then you sprayed it in a couple weeks that you wouldn't really get, you know, the seedlings surviving through the winter because they could go into the winter being kind of weak. So in your situation, I'd probably do a non-selective and seed now, and we're still in the window, it's getting late, but if you could do that as soon as possible, that would be a really good step to having you know a good lawn next year. Okay, great, hey, yep. thanks. You bet. All right, next up. I'm Linda Eberspacher and I live in rural Seward. Um, I, that's another Creeping Charlie, because she just said, that's Creeping Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> We'd always call it henbit, and I had someone treating for it, and it kind of kept it at bay, and a new person treating, and it has taken over our yard. Should Yeah, so henbit is a winter annual, so that's one that we see in the, in the spring, and so when it's taking over in the summer, you definitely know it's not henbit. So sometimes you can confuse them, but if you see one taking over this time of the year, um, if, if it's taking over, but again, there's grass there, um, products that contain things like uh, triclopyr um, are a lot more effective uh, on that one. Um, for example, there's a product too, uh, Roundup for Lawns. Uh, it's not Roundup, it's Roundup for Lawns. It's actually just okay. selective herbicides. Okay. And some of those herbicides are, are kind of newer herbicides and are not a traditional, you know, homeowner type herbicide spray. And they're a lot more effective on these types of weeds. And so I might consider, you know, trying that application too. And it might be two applications. We're just starting to get into the window for your first application. Come back a couple of weeks later if it's really hard. Try to clean it up. But then again, think about what can we do to get that lawn more competitive. Mowing a little bit higher, get that density up so that we don't have this guy take, that, take over. Are we going to have to face the same thing next year, you think? Or if we do Roundup for lawns? Um, you might. And so it's something that you have to just kind of be after. And again, thinking about what you're doing for your lawn first, and then um, over time with persistence, you'll be able to take control of that. Okay. Thank yep. you very much. We are celebrating the 10th year in the Backyard Farmer Garden, and it's a beautiful day to be doing that. If you are watching us on Facebook, make sure you give us the thumbs up, tell us how we're doing, and tell us whether or not we should continue this series next year because it's brand new this year. All right. Your turn. Hi, I'm Sharon Berry from right here in Lincoln. And I brought two. One is my rose bush, and that did fine in the spring. And now it looks like that, and there's no second blooms. And the phlox, I've had the phlox for years in the last three seasons. It gets the powdery mildew towards the end of the season. But in the spring, it gets little orange bugs, orange and black bugs. And I thought I sprayed for them, but it never blooms. So on your rose, we got a couple of things going on. Um, if you can take a look at the leaf here that we have that weird coloration going on. We've got the yellow and the green, and that's not a normal coloration. Um, we also have this flower head here that is um, really faded, it's starting to, it didn't come out right. And so we're looking at probably at Botrytis for this one, just because it's that weird looking flower bud that came out and it's not quite right. So with this guy, you know, I'd go in and I'd clean up. Um, the old wives tale is that you take it down to a leaflet of five and prune it. 
um, and try to take this part off to try to get that out of there. Try to do good fall cleanup with this rose and try to get as many of these leaves out of there as you can. Um, and then look again for next year to see what happens. You know, if you have parts of the rose that's red and really super thorny, um, then we'd be looking at rose rosette. This one doesn't look very red to me. And so that's where we could be looking at some kind of viral infection with this coloration that's all like this. So I'd make sure to disinfect my pruning tools in between cuts with like a 10% bleach solution. And then I'd also just look and see what happens next year. If you really want to know the answer, I'd send a sample into the diagnostic clinic just so they could confirm um, or deny if it is some kind of viral infection with that. All right. Okay, and then I've got the flocks, and I can see actually one of your uh, little flocks plant bugs on here. And so they suck the sap, and that's why some of the discoloration on the leaves. But I'm, I've seen a lot of bugs, but usually they still will flower on some of them. Not so maybe year. over time, no? Not this year. So Mine did the same thing. Really? Yep. What's, can, will they ever come back, or are we going no. to have to replant? I would go to a plant sale the next time there's <laughs> one and get some new flocks. In other words, I need to get new ones. Yeah, yeah so that might be the future. So of one some. of the unfortunate things about flocks, when they get that flocks plant bug, if it gets that bad, they do distort the flowers. And I've never, I've never had them do that to my flocks flowers mm -hmm. until this year. Yesterday, I dug them all up and threw them away. Okay. Done. New plant. That's Great opportunity. Solution. Yeah. Powdery mildew resistant with the next ones. David, which is white. Powdery, and some of the newer ones, like yep. different colors. They're resistant, yes. right? Yep. yep, you want to select a resistant variety. It's going to save you a lot more headache down the road. But okay. not resistant to flocks plant No, bug. unfortunately with that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, we're just the bearers of bad news today. <laughs> I'm Sandra Zig. I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska, and I've just returned after being 20 years in Texas, and I'm back to seeing the same old problems. <laughs> you know, that ground ivy, whatever, that's, uh, anyway. I'm here about critter questions. I have tomatoes that, that look like they're going eat, eat, being eaten, and I've seen foxes in the neighborhood, and we have squirrels, and we have a raccoon that gets up on our roof. Help! <laughs> okay, so a fox pretty much is a carnivore, and it, I mean, they'll take a little bit of vegetation, and they would take the whole tomato. So is the tomato being eaten from the bottom, or is it the side, or the whole thing's gone? Like half of it. Like half of it from the side? Yeah. So that can easily be a squirrel or a raccoon. Right. So if the bite is bigger than a quarter, it is a raccoon. raccoon. <laughs> if the bite is smaller than a quarter, it's size a into it, then it's a tree squirrel. Oh, fox. Yeah. Okay, the fox, is, the fox is a carnivore and would just take the whole thing back with it and you wouldn't see anything. Uh, if they even want a tomato, fox are pretty much carnivores and don't. So, um, so you got two problems there. But if you have fox, you're less likely to have rabbits, which will help you in the future. Um, <laughs> that may be causing a problem. So with, with, with tree squirrels, you got cats. You got bats? Cats. Well, around us. Okay. So. Oh, cats. Okay. Um, the cats just keep the squirrels in the tree. So for, so for the the raccoons, if they're the bigger culprit. Live trapping or cage box trapping is the only thing you can do. Oh, we did put in a live trap and they left the can of clams empty. Okay. <laughs> That's, so don't use clams. For a raccoon, the way you they do it. They loved them. Yeah, I'm sure they did. Either that or the cat did. For raccoons, you use marshmallows because no other animal okay. wants marshmallows, so you won't get bycatch. Mm -hmm. And you don't put it in the cage. You never, when you baiting a cage trap, or a box trap you never put in the bottom. You hang it from the top with a piece of baling wire or a piece of something. So they see it straight in yeah. and they have to go in after it and they step on that. They can't put their neck over okay. the treadle and take your bait and then back out with their big fat furry butt. Yeah. Nobody's so that ever way told us. <laughs> they walk in and they go like this and they hit that treadle and then they're stuck in there. Okay, well, thanks a lot. And Appreciate that's the, it. That's the best way to get those. Thanks. I guess we have another question after that. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> Hello. 
Hello, I'm Lori Halpenny from Omaha, Nebraska, and I have a critter question. Okay. Because um, I was feeling sorry for Dennis because I don't have any many questions. <laughs> it's okay. I'll get hundreds of phone calls. So. <laughs> so anyway, this is for a friend, really a friend, not myself. Yeah, yeah. So she okay. has uh, bats in her attic, and they came and they were removed. However, the bat they were released, and then they just came and flew right back in. Right. Okay. So. <laughs> What should have been done is, besides removal, they should use what we call one-way doors okay. in the attic. That allows all of them to go out, because usually you never have one bat. It's usually 25 to 100 in the attic. Um, and then you put what we call one-way doors, and these could be simple. Direct, we get all the designs at our website, wildlife.unl.edu. But once you leave the one-way doors there for a week, then you can patch up all the cracks then they can't get back in. And bats have very fragile teeth, so you can patch it up with anything, duct tape, foam, and then they have to find another place to live. And that'll get rid of them permanently from that house. Um, or if you went up there, you would have to catch all of them. And the, the regulations do not allow you to move it farther than it will come back. See, the state regulations say you can only move it 100 yards. That's everything raccoons, squirrels, so you either have to euthanize it, which we don't want you to euthanize the bats, so you exclude, okay? Then you can release. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay. One more question and then we will have to wrap. Okay. Don Cater, right, from Council Bus, Iowa. It's, it was hard for me to start calling you a backyard farmer because I was grew up with uh, over the garden fence. Remember that? No. <laughs> no? That's way back. Go over the garden fence was the show just like this, but that's what it was called. But anyway, my question is on canning. Does anybody can? You know, we talk about tomatoes all the time, but nobody talks about canning them. So when it comes to canning, your best bet's to talk to a foods person. Uh -huh. um, and so the University of Nebraska does have quite a few people that deal with foods and canning. Um, I have canned in the past, but I am not the one to quote regulations on well, canning. Well, I was wondering if you did or not, because it was a strange question, but uh, uh, how long do you keep it? You know, I have some stuff that was 2017, and you know, is that past the prime or? Uh, Depends on what it is and how it got canned. And my mother used to can, and there was always something that blew up in the basement. So. <laughs> then you know it's no good. Yeah. Okay, that's about it, that's all, thank Most you. Most of the time it's a year. All right, and you know what? That is all the time we have for Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. We really appreciate our audience for this and, of course, those great questions. You can watch us on Facebook. It's been a great season. Give us that thumbs up and tell us whether you want to see us again next year.